Have you ever done something wrong and think, well, I can't go to God and apologize because I'll just get the heavy hand? Well, I think we all have. In today's message from the parable of the prodigal son, we find out maybe God's not like that at all. Hope you enjoy it. Okay, turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 15. Luke chapter 15 has three parables that are all related. It's called the lost parables, meaning your parables about losing something. One time I lost a, anybody remember pocket PCs? They were like before the phone, like a little device you could keep things on. I was very excited. I spent $200 on a pocket PC. I lost it the first week I had it. <laughs> I'm still sore about it. I spent several days putting in all my information, phone numbers, contacts, my calendar, got it synced to everything. Put it in the, in the door of our vehicle. Why, I don't know. Somewhere in my travels the first week, it, it disappeared. I guess somebody enjoyed that after that and had fun with my pocket PC <laughs> with all my contacts and calendar. But uh, who, who knows what happened to it. But you know how it is. You lose something, especially like if you're trying to head out the door, you like, can't find your keys. Or you, you lose your billfold. You lose something very valuable. First thing you do is, oh, come on. First thing you do is you panic. Say a lot of things you probably shouldn't say. You may or may not calm down enough to say, okay, I'm going to pray about this. God's going to help me find it. If you don't, you might never find it. There's a lot of things we can lose in life. A lot of things are valuable to us. But isn't it nice when you find it? I found that most of the time on that kind of stuff, it's like, I can't, why did I put it there? I mean, you know, don't even question yourself. Why did I put my keys on top of the refrigerator or whatever? But it's a glorious time when you find what you've lost that's very important to you. It's really the key theme here is that when you find something that you've lost, there needs to be a great celebration in store. These things are going to point to lost people, which is even more important. So what we'll do is going to read through the whole thing first, and then go back and look at it between the lines. So Luke chapter 15, verse 1. But all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to Jesus to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying. So he spoke this parable to the scribes and Pharisees. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. And he tells a second short story. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the whole house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now the third parable, which a lot of us probably know. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after that, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when we had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land and began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed his swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, 
How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will rise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he arose, and he said, and he, so he arose, and he came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, and he had compassion. And he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet. Bring the fatty calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost. And now he's found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants, asking what these things meant. And he said to him, Well, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But the brother was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him, so he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed, transgressed your commandment at any time. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I may make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again. And was lost, and now is found. It's an incredible story. Why did he start saying these things? Well, if you look back at the beginning, it says the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to Jesus to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So they're complaining, Why are you hanging out with these people? You know, and, and the way we believe, the scribes and Pharisees, the way that they stay holy is to stay away from people like this. Their way of staying holy was to not be with these people. Are there people that you hang out with that are considered not the best? Who's the crowd that you hang out with and why? Jesus made a point to go hang out with the people that he was quote-unquote not supposed to hang out with. Why is that? Well, we'll find out. The audience he was speaking to was, was unapproving. And, and then he told that parable, two parables about the shepherds, and it's a parable about a woman. Both those groups were not people that would be respected in this day and time. Women didn't have a lot of say in anything. Of course, they couldn't vote or do anything like that or have any say. And shepherds were kind of the lowest of the low in the communities at that time. They were considered dirty and filthy, and they never took a bath, and they were out with the sheep all the time. So these are both people that Jesus used in his story to say that people rejoiced because they found something that was lost to them. The first one, one of 99, that's 1%, but they still rejoiced. The second one was one of 10, one of 10 coins she lost. So that means that she lost 10% of everything she owned. Who would not rejoice over finding that? And the third story, it's a much higher percentage, isn't it? It's a person's life. So in verse 11, let's look at it. He said, there's a man who had two sons. The younger son said to his father, give me now part of your property that I'm supposed to receive someday. So the father divided his wealth between his two sons. So first thing you say, what's going on here? Okay, they would have an inheritance. The bigger portion of the inheritance would go to the older son. There's still a part of the inheritance that would go to the younger son once the father dies. It was possible, though, at that time to get it ahead of time, if need be. If somebody was in financial straits. In this situation, though, the younger son just wanted it. He wanted it early. He doesn't want to wait until his father dies to get his inheritance. Uh, first thing you have to ask is, why did the father give it to him? I, oh, I, you know, I'm thinking, if we had that scenario going on today, why would we go ahead and do this? I, the first thing I would think of is that maybe he knew one way or another his younger son needed to go, quote, unquote, sow his wild oats no matter what. I'm just going to go ahead and give it to you. Get this out of the way. Let's just do this now. I know that one way or another, you're going to have to learn the hard way. So I'm just going to go ahead and give it to you. But I don't think it's the best idea. That's one possibility. We don't know. We're just speculating. Second, 
Maybe he went ahead and give it to him now, knowing that he was going to have a great fall and that he could help him recuperate from that while he was still alive. So he thought, well, if my son gets this when I'm, when I'm dead, there's not going to be anybody there to pick him up when he falls. Well, those are two possibilities that, that are there. Either way, whatever the reason, the father said, okay, here you go. Take these thousands of dollars, and uh, let's uh, see what happens. Verse 13, a few days later, the younger son gathered up all he had and left. He left. He didn't stay in Winchester. He didn't stay with his family. He went way far away. Why is that? Why did he take his money and go somewhere else? Maybe it's because he was, knew he was going to do things that his father and his family would not approve of. He traveled far away to another country, and there he wasted his money living like a fool. So, there you go. Went to another place. He wanted to do what he wanted to do with his money. He don't want to have to live under his parents' rule anymore or anything like that. He knows what's best. He's going to go have him a big time, and apparently he did. Because in verse 14 it says, after he spent everything, he spent everything he had. There was a terrible famine throughout the country, and then he was hungry and needed money. That's a good lesson to be learned right there. Always prepare for a rainy day. It's godly to save up, have something in case something happens that you never expected. Who would have expected that we would have this situation that we've had over the past year or so? If somebody would have told me 10 years ago what was going to be going on in our world today, I would dare say I probably wouldn't have believed it. I was like, oh, well, there's that's no way it's going to happen. Were you prepared? I don't know. Some people were, some people weren't. In this situation, this person had no preparation for the famine that was about to happen. So what did he do? Basically, he went and begged for a job from somebody he barely even knew. Man sent him in the field to feed pigs. This is kind of like the lowest of the low of jobs. Okay? It's like the, the job that nobody wants. Pigs say that they hear, they say pigs ate pods, which is basically a type of vegetation that they would live on. And he was so hungry that he wanted to eat the food that the pigs were eating. But what happened? Nobody gave him anything. His family wasn't around there to help him out. Nobody had compassion on him. They're basically, we don't really know you. You got yourself into this situation, so you're going to have to pay the price. Then what happened? I don't know if it happened immediately. We don't know how much time it elapsed, but it says the son realized that he had been very foolish. In the King James Version, it says, he came to himself. He came to his senses. He realized what he had done. And he said to himself, all my father's hired workers have plenty of food, but here I am almost dead because I have nothing to eat. Therefore, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to go back to the place where I should have been in the first place. I'm going to leave and go back to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against God and I've done wrong to you. This is called repentance. He is sorry for what he's done. He realizes the error of his ways. Did he know what his father was going to react to this? How he was going to react? I know I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, so let me be just like one of your hired workers. That's what this speech he prepared before he traveled home. And it says, so he left and he went to his father. Obviously, his head was down. He was dejected. He had blown his whole inheritance that he was going to get someday. Probably had thought about it his whole life, that one day he was going to have this money, he could do what he wanted to do with it, and now it's all gone. Not even that, but he can't even survive on his own. So here's where it gets interesting. While the son was still a long way off, his father saw him coming and felt sorry for him. He was a long way off, and he saw him coming. He had compassion on him. There's a lot in that statement right there. First of all, he recognized his son. How? The way he walks. How he carries himself. And I can always, can always tell... In our house, when Colton goes up and down the steps, when Daisy, our dog, goes up and down the steps, I can tell by the gate, the sound, the walk, everything, 
The father knew his son so well that he could tell a long ways off it was him. Probably was walking with his head down, dejected. The father knew if his son's coming back like that, by himself, walking slowly, head down, he's going to have compassion for him because he knows what happened. So what did he do? He ran to him. First thing we have to understand is back in this time, it was very uh, disrespectful for the head of the household or a father to run in public at all. So he threw off all social convictions and he said, I'm going to run after my son that I have compassion for, that I love. Even though I knew he was going to mess it up, I'm going to run to him and show him compassion and forgiveness. So he ran to him and he hugged and kissed him. And the son said, okay, this is nice because the son is the first one that speaks up and says, here's the repentance. Father, I have sinned against God. I've done wrong to you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So he followed through on his speech. But the father said to his servants, hurry, bring the best clothes, put them on him, put a ring on his finger, and good sandals on his feet. Why is that important? Clothing, I'm sure he didn't look or smell the best. Get him some new clothes. The ring on the finger signifies, you are my son. They were called signet rings, family rings. You are part of the family. Even though you've done this wrong, you've asked for forgiveness, you are forgiven. Me as your father has compassion on you. You are part of this family. And not only so much, you're gonna, I'm putting sandals on your feet. Why is he doing that? I'm giving you another start. You're going to go more places than just here. You're going to give another chance in life. You're going to have to walk in your life to places. Let's get you a good pair of sandals. And then, obviously, meet the need, right? Got to be hungry. Let's have a celebration. Let's get our best calf and kill it so we can celebrate with plenty to eat. People need to know this is how compassion and forgiveness works. We should celebrate because we found a lost coin. We found a lost sheep. Even more so, son was dead but found again. Here it is. My son was dead, but now he is alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. So they begin to have a party. Everybody loves a party, don't they? And here we have something to party about. It's a big deal because we, we don't really know how long he was gone. We are pretty sure that the father did not go looking for him. He just waited. And I'm sure prayed and wondered what was going on out there with his son. And apparently after a very long time, he sees him coming and says, this is the time that he comes back. This is the time we need to show compassion. Put that ring on his finger. He's still part of our family. All right, here comes character number three. It could have ended there. It had been a great story right there. It could have ended. But remember who the audience was. Jesus was talking to people did not understand why he was associating with the people he was associating with. Let's put them in the story, right? So verse 25, the older son had been out in the field working, obviously, doing what he thought he needed to do. When he came near the house, he heard the sound of music and dancing. So he called the one of the, he didn't go in and ask what was going on. He said, ask one of the servants. Hey, what's, what's, what's going on in there? What's all this mean? The servant knew. The servant said, well, your brother has come back. And your father, he killed the best calf to eat. And he's happy because he has his son, your brother, back safe and sound. So the brother said, great. I missed, I missed him so much. You know, let's all celebrate. Wrong. The brother said, what? That's not fair. I've been here all this time doing all this work. I'm not out squandering everything. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. And now we're going to have a party. Verse 28, the older son was angry. He wouldn't go into the party. Stood outside, pouting. So, what did the father do? The father goes out. Wouldn't come in, he goes out. He says, come on in. You don't understand. When you lose something and you find it, it's a joyous thing. Don't be out here. Don't be like that. This is your brother. This is our family. Come on in. He said to his father, look, all these years I've worked like a slave for you. I've always done what you told me to do. You never, <laughs> you never even gave me a young goat for a party with my friends. Oh, poor thing. 
But then this son of yours, it doesn't say my brother, he distances himself from him. This son of yours, that son of, so this happens in our house sometimes. When my kids get in trouble, John goes, well, that son of yours, <laughs> that's your son too. He says, uh, this son of yours comes home after wasting all your money on prostitutes and who knows what all, and you kill the best calf for him. It's not fair, Dad. His father said, you know what? You are my son. You're, you're correct. You've always been with me, and everything I have is yours. He's a firstborn son. When he dies, he gets all inheritance. But this is a day to be happy and celebrate. Your brother was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. One person that joys the kingdom is rejoicing in heaven. That's what it said in the earlier parable in uh, verse 10 there. It says, I say to you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. If I could stand up here for the next 50 years, God willing, if one sinner repents, it's all worth it. Because there's a celebration in heaven. If we can add anything to that, to anybody in our lives around us all the time, do it. Don't be like the jealous brother. It's a celebration. So, we can learn from the three main characters. And we'll finish with this. Sometimes we are all three of those people. First thing we need to do to make sure we are not being like the jealous brother. We've all been like the jealous brother sometime in life. You know, think in your work world, somebody got a promotion you didn't get. What? I've been here and I've worked for 35 years. This person got the job, got the promotion, they've only been here two months. That's not fair. We've all been the jealous person. Especially when somebody comes to Christ and yeah, you'll be sitting right beside of your church. You know all that they've done, especially the past weekend. All of a sudden, they're going and they're saying they're going to change their life and repent and join heaven. You'd rejoice because your brother or sister did that. Not be jealous. Don't, don't be like the jealous brother. Number two, what about the father? How can we be more like the father? We need to tell ourselves we need to be more compassionate. And patient. Father's patient. Woo! Who knows how long he waited for the son to come back. We've got to be more compassionate and patient with people. Sometimes we just have to let them do their thing. Sometimes people are going to go and they're going to do the craziest things. Sometimes you just got to let them do it. Especially with your children. You can only do so much for them and then sometimes you just got to say, you know what? Time to just cut you loose. You take this money got to go do what you got to do. It's going to kill me. It's going to kill me to let you do it. It's going to be hard. But you go do it. Go sell your wild oats. I'll be praying for you. Hopefully one day they come back. You know what? Sometimes in those situations they don't. It's really difficult. But nonetheless, you have to learn to be more compassionate and patient with people. And third, the third one is probably the most important role that we need to look at is the prodigal son, the lost son. How can we be that person that repent, repents freely, comes back to God? That's something that we can do on a daily basis, weekly basis. It can be something that if you've never done, then it needs to be done today. It's something that the father, what? Does he scold you when you say you've done wrong and you want to ask for forgiveness? You've rehearsed your speech. You go to your father. You say, I'm sorry and I repent. And the father raises his finger at you and says, I knew you were going to do that. I knew you were going to screw it up. I'm not going to forgive you. That's ridiculous what you did. Is that what the compassionate father did? No. The compassionate father said, come here. Get in here. Let's get a hook. Let's get, let's get the ring on your finger. Let's have a party. Let's get the ribeyes out of the freezer. Let's have a party because you're home. We'll talk. I'm sure they talked about the details later. 
being a father and a son that came home, I'm sure he said, okay, there are going to be repercussions for what you did. You know, there, there are repercussions. You're broke. It's built on inheritance. You've got to have a job. So, yeah, I might start you as one of the, as one of the servants. But what did the son say? He said, that'd be, that'd be great. So, well, you know, he's humbled at this point. He got that big chip knocked off his shoulder. Now he goes back and he's like, oh, I'll be a servant. That's better than feeding the pigs out in Mount Sterling. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, uh, but, you know, this is what we're saying is that now repentance, the Father meets you with compassion. You're lost. Now you're found. People every day around us are lost. They need to know this story. The people he's talking to, that Jesus talked to these scribes and Pharisees, needed to hear this. They're all judgmental, thinking that they had everything right. Jesus said, no, that's not what it's about. Here's what it's about. We're all sinners. We're all going to make mistakes. But when you do, repent. Run to the Father. He will have compassion, and he will welcome you home. Let's pray.